in late November 2016 in Toronto, a story unfolds. A story which marries surgical precision with a hidden darkness. Dr. Alana Frick, a family physician and neurosurgeon, harbored a clandestine truth which cast a chilling shadow over her esteemed reputation. Behind the facade of professional claim lay a marriage steeped in a darkness concealed from her family, friends, colleagues, and the world at large. What seemed like an ordinary tale of success in the medical field would soon unravel into a tragic climax, etching a somber chapter in Canadian history. As we dive into this narrative, envision the weight of dark secrets beneath the veneer of success, where the pursuit of freedom takes an unexpected and perilous turn. Greetings, dear viewers, and welcome back to another somber chapter from the archives of Memento Mori stories. I'm Ella Favela, your guide through the realm of history, creativity, horror, and true crime. Today, we embark on a tale which delves into the darkest corners of Canadian history, where the veneer of social standing conceals the sinister realities of domestic abuse. But, dear listeners, let's not approach this narrative as just distant observers. Instead, let's immerse ourselves in a world veiled in shadows. Here, the brilliance of a renowned neurosurgeon dances a macabre waltz with a remarkably common foe, intimate partner violence. Before we dive into today's story, I must offer a heads up. It covers sensitive and graphic topics which may not be suitable for everyone. The story dives into abuse and violence and it may be distressing for some viewers. If you're currently dealing with these issues or if you have a history of trauma yourself, please take care of number one. You can choose to skip this video, watch it with someone you trust, or seek professional support if need be. We've provided resources and links in the description for you below. I share these stories not to sensationalize the darker aspects of human nature, but to shed light on them and to learn from them. Discussing these matters can help to break the silence and the stigma surrounding them, empowering ourselves and others to heal and to grow. By creating art inspired by these stories, we can transform pain into beauty and darkness into light. Now, let the echoes of this cautionary tale serve as a harbinger, urging us to confront the uncomfortable truths that reside even within the most privileged echelons of our society. Today, we delve into a story where social standing allowed darkness to flourish and where the act of breaking free became the most dangerous journey of all. Consider yourself warned and proceed with caution. It's time to grab your paintbrushes, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and prepare yourself, dear viewer, for a wild ride. Picture this, a brilliant mind making waves in the medical community, earning her respect left and right. But you see, success doesn't tell the whole story. Behind those achievements and accolades was a reality that Alana kept hidden. One that too many people out there can unfortunately relate to, the battle against domestic abuse. Dr. Alana Frick, a life which seemed like a textbook success story. She wasn't just your regular physician. She was a respected family physician at the Scarborough Hospital and a delegate for the Ontario Medical Association. She was highly accomplished, having graduated from the University of Ottawa's medical school and receiving a master's degree from Duke in public policy. She was also a long distance runner. Her journey in the medical field was no joke. She wasn't just your average doctor. She climbed the ladder, earning the respect of her colleagues and the gratitude of her many patients. Beyond the accolades and the surgical precision, Dr. Frick wasn't just a neurosurgeon. She was a healing force in the lives of her patients. Her commitment to the medical field went well beyond routine checkups and surgeries. 
It was a dedication to understanding the intricacies of the human condition. As a family physician and neurosurgeon, her compassion extended far beyond the sterile walls of the operating room. She was a guiding light for those navigating the complexities of their health journeys. Patients weren't just cases to Alana. They were individuals with stories, fears, and hopes. Her approach to medicine was holistic, recognizing that healing went beyond the physical ailments. It encompassed the emotional and the psychological well-being of each person that she cared for. Mohammed Shamji, a respected neurosurgeon, crossed paths with Alana in 2004 while they were both attending medical school at the University of Ottawa. What blossomed from this encounter was a love story that, for a time, thrived on shared dreams and aspirations. On the outside, they embodied success, a power couple scaling the peaks of their medical careers. Mohammed, renowned as a neurosurgeon in his own right, stood side by side with Alana, creating an image of professional achievement and shared accomplishments. However, beneath this veneer of success lurked the complexities of their relationship. Mohammed's career, while impressive, was also a source of tension within their marriage. The demands of two thriving medical professionals navigating their paths often clashed, revealing the strain that often accompanies such ambitious pursuits. From the very beginning of their 12 year long marriage, Mohammed presented an arrogant demeanor and a controlling nature. Ilana knew that Mohammed had anger problems, but was quiet about the escalating abuse she was enduring at home. Her parents recall an instance when they called Frick's home. The phone was answered, but all they heard was Mohammed yelling, you you stupid Shamji would receive a peace bond and 12 months probation for splitting Frick's lip in 2005. However, this did not change his behavior. Concurrently, the couple had begun to build their social media presence as well. The affectionate power couple, parents balancing full-time careers, blessed with beautiful children and so proud of their relationship. Truly idyllic from the outside looking in. However, Ilana would confide to a few friends about how Mohammed kept a tight grip on her social media. It wasn't just about monitoring. He practically took the reins, deciding who stayed on her friends list and curating the photos that would make it to the public eye. It was like he was crafting this carefully choreographed version of their lives, one that suited his narrative. At home, the control didn't stop. It seeped into the day-to-day -day decisions, like needing his permission to subscribe to a newspaper. Can you fathom that? Even something as routine as that would require his approval. And more often than not, he would say no. And it wasn't just about newspapers. He would dictate who their kids could be friends with, setting standards that were as arbitrary as they were rigid. Back in 2011, Mohammed headed to Calgary for a year long fellowship at the Foothills Medical Center, honing his skills in spinal surgery. It was during this time that Ilana stumbled upon unsettling facts. It turns out, Mohammed was having an affair with a colleague in Calgary. The discovery came through emails and a credit card payment that Mohammed made for a race he ran with his mistress on Mother's Day. When confronted, Mohammed didn't deny it. Ilana, devastated by the revelation, faced the tough choice of leaving. Friends would urge her to, but she would hesitate. Despite the affair, she craved Mohammed's approval, yearning to prove herself as his equal. The years invested in their relationship, two children, a shared life and a home, it all made leaving seem like an insurmountable task. Love still lingered and the desire for reciprocation remained. Promises were made. Mohammed pledged to end the affair and soon after he landed his dream job at Toronto Western Hospital as a surgeon on the neurosurgical team. 
the couple planned their move to Toronto, necessitating Alana to give up her practice. A substantial $1.5 million home in North York became their new haven. Ilana settled for a job at the Earl Bales walk-in clinic, but the routine left her feeling underwhelmed. Her sentiment was clear. She didn't want her medical expertise limited to treating sore throats. In the midst of their new life, Mohammed brought up the idea of expanding their family, pointing to the vacant bedroom that awaited a new occupant. The lure of having a boy played a part in this suggestion. Within a few months, Ilana found herself pregnant. She held on to the hope that the upcoming birth would serve as a reset button for their marriage, a chance for renewal and healing. In October, 2013, Ilana and Mohammed welcomed their son into the world. For almost two years, their relationship settled into an uneasy truce. Ilana's daughters flourished in private school and at Toronto Western, Mohammed gained acclaim as a miracle worker. Patients like Joseph Grossman, saved from a spinal epidural abscess, would praise Mohammed's patience and humility. Another woman, not even a patient at Toronto Western, sought his expertise to translate complex medical jargon about a brain tumor for her family. They found him kind and accommodating. In 2015, Ilana took on a more challenging role at the Scarborough Hospital's Family Medicine Unit and became a delegate for District 11 of the Ontario Medical Association. Professionally thriving, her success sparked renewed tension in her relationship with Mohammed. The turning point came during a family ski trip to Vermont in March 2016. Passing through Ottawa to drop their son at Mohammed's parents' house, a call from Mohammed revealed that Alana had badly cut her right palm and she was undergoing surgery in the hospital. Different stories emerged about the incident. Ilana mentioned an accidental glass slam on the counter, cutting her hand while chopping vegetables to someone else, and a broken glass during dishwashing to another friend. The inconsistencies hinted at an underlying complexity, which cast a shadow of doubt on the apparent harmony of their lives. During a vacation, tensions would resurface, with the focal point once again being Mohammed's affair. The heated argument escalated to disturbing levels when he uttered words like, she's a much better lover than you. Ilana shared with her friends that this verbal assault turned physical, with Mohammed allegedly choking her. Since the incident took place in Vermont, Ilana refrained from reporting it, driven by a fear of potential repercussions on a man named Mohammed in the United States. The complex dynamics of this relationship were unraveling. Throughout the summer of 2016, the ebb and flow of their relationship swung between chaos and calm, with the baby staying with family for a few weeks and the girls at a summer camp in Ottawa. Mohammed and Alana found themselves alone in the house for the entire month of July. Despite the tumultuous undercurrents, their social media profiles maintained a cheerful facade. Engaging in a shared pursuit, they both started studying jujitsu, and Alana even posted a lighthearted photo on Instagram of Mohammed in his gi, captioned, Two Stripe Dr. Mo, can break your neck and then fix it. The facade extended to their 12th and ultimately final wedding anniversary celebration complete with a card from Alana expressing her enduring love and the anticipation she held for the next 50 years. Contrary to the online portrayal, real life was anything but sunny. As fall approached, Ilana revisited the topic of divorce with Mohammed. Panicking, he pleaded with her for time to get his act together, a plea to which he reluctantly would agree. However, her suspicion lingered fueled by ongoing doubts about Mohammed's fidelity. When she would confide in her friends about her concerns, one would jokingly suggest that Ilana should have her own affair. Taking the suggestion to heart, Ilana did embark on an affair connecting with another doctor who, like her, was married with children. This newfound connection brought a sustained sense of happiness, a feeling she hadn't experienced since her 20s became a catalyst for her to envision a life independent of Mohammed, 
setting the stage for a significant shift in the narrative. As fall drew to a close, the time Alana had allotted for Mohammed to save their deteriorating marriage had expired. Unbeknownst to those in her life, she had confided in a lawyer about a serious assault she endured at Mohammed's hands in October. The violence had become unbearable, and now, driven by a determination to protect her children, Ilana decided it was time to end the marriage. marriage. In late November, she made the courageous decision to initiate divorce proceedings. Mohammed, in a last-ditch effort, bought her a massive box of chocolates in an attempt to convince her to stay. However, Ilana had reached her breaking point. In an email to a friend on November 24th, she apologized for her recent absence, revealing her decision to separate and to divorce from her husband due to the chaos at home. That weekend, she attended an OMA meeting, actively participating in panels and networking without Mohammed, who on social media was playing the role of a supportive husband. Upon her return, she disclosed to her closest confidants that she had retained a lawyer and served Mohammed with divorce papers. Despite moving into the basement, Mohammed would persistently bring her belongings back to their shared bedroom. On Wednesday night, during a call with her mother, Ilana, giving the baby a bath, expressed concern over Mohammed's potential actions. Her mother advised caution, to which Ilana responded, he's not going to do anything stupid. Later that night, Ilana made one more call to 611, possibly attempting to dial 911, but narrowly missing the first digit. The stage would be set for the tumultuous events that would unfold in the following days. The next morning, attempts to reach Ilana proved futile. Concerned, her family reached out to Mohammed, who provided various versions of the same story. Ilana had left during the night with a suitcase and her boyfriend. Growing increasingly concerned, Ilana's mother, Anna Frick, enlisted the help of Allison, Ilana's neighbor and former boss, to investigate. A peek into the garage revealed that Ilana's Honda Pilot was still parked there. Worried, the Fricks called the police, packed a bag, and drove overnight from Windsor to Toronto. Arriving at 5 a.m. on Friday, they let themselves into the home. Two rugs from the main floor were missing, but Anna, attempting to maintain a semblance of normalcy, proceeded to do the dishes and to prepare breakfast for the children. Upstairs, Mohammed, engaged in a phone call, didn't bother to come down to greet them. Her parents are here, he mentioned on the call. Minutes later, a phone call disrupted the house, revealing that all the wireless phones had been gathered and hoarded in the bedroom. The two older children silently descended the stairs, heads down, as their grandmother served them breakfast. When Mohammed finally made his way down the stairs, he nonchalantly remarked, so you're the ones who called the police, before casually inquiring about more crepes. Later that afternoon, the police made a grim discovery. Ilana hadn't left with her suitcase as Mohammed had claimed. She was inside of it. The cause of her death was manual asphyxiation and blunt force trauma. Her lifeless body, dressed in pajamas with nearly all her hair brutally cut off, was crammed into a suitcase that her mother had given her. The bag, still bearing the tag from their last trip to Croatia, was discarded beside the Humber River in Kleinberg. Ilana, barefoot and unrecognizable due to facial swelling, was identified by her grieving mother, who tearfully uttered, that's my daughter. The narrowing truth of Ilana's fate sent shockwaves through her family, unraveling the layers of deception that had concealed her tragic end. end. The following day, Mohammed Shamji found himself in custody, apprehended at a Timothy's coffee shop in Mississauga. 
Two plainclothes officers approached him at a corner table before quietly placing him in handcuffs. The charge he now faced was murder in the first degree in connection to the death of Alana Frick. Disturbingly, court filings from the Fricks revealed that he swiftly moved nearly the entirety of his family's liquid assets, totaling $640,000 from his professional corporation's account to his lawyer's trust account, accompanied by the note, legal fees. Alana's funeral took place on December 17th at St. Francis, the Windsor church where she had been baptized, confirmed, and married. During the ceremony, her younger daughter bravely read one of Alana's poems, penned during her youth, which was titled, Hillside Strangers. It begins, we climb away on our chosen path with only our soul as a guide. In the aftermath, Anna and Joe, Alana's parents, moved into their daughter's house, ensuring that Alana's children could maintain as normal a life as possible. Mohammed Shamji was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 14 years. However, it's likely that he'll never see the light of day ever again. According to CTV Toronto, the three children now live with their grandparents on their mother's side in Windsor, Ontario. Anna Frick says that they are doing well and spoke of visiting the grave on Mother's Day. She claims that the children never speak of their jailed father. In the aftermath of the gruesome murder of Ontario Dr. Alana Frick, the lead detective reflected on a poignant question about the potential impact of intervention. Could she still be alive today if friends and colleagues who were all aware of the domestic abuse unfolding in her home had spoken up? It's a haunting consideration which underscores the role of silence in perpetuating tragedies. Examining the social landscape surrounding Alana, the detective notes a troubling pattern. Her circle comprised of highly educated and successful people, many of them doctors at the pinnacle of their own careers. Despite their awareness and suspicions regarding the physical abuse which she endured at the hands of her husband, a collective silence prevailed. The detective's musing prompts a broader reflection on the responsibility of those who witness signs of domestic abuse, especially when the victim is a professional working in a field of mandated reporters. The chilling realization that a tragedy could have been averted with timely intervention serves as a stark reminder of the societal implications of turning a blind eye to abuse even when seemingly successful and accomplished circles are considered. As we navigate the profound sorrow within Alana Frick's story, my heart goes out to her children and the enduring pain which they bear. The loss of a mother is an indescribable ache, and it's my hope that in time they can find solace in the memories and the love which she leaves behind. In honor of Alana Frick, let us collectively hold space for her memory, celebrating the strength and resilience she displayed in the face of unimaginable challenges. May her legacy endure as a testament to the ongoing conversation surrounding domestic abuse, inspiring change, and empathy. Alana's story serves as a poignant reminder of the silent battles waged within seemingly successful lives, challenging the perception that professional achievement can shield individuals from the perils of domestic abuse. Her case underscores the imperative for society to break the shackles of silence and to dismantle the stigma surrounding intimate partner violence, regardless of whether or not a person fits the stereotypes of what a victim should look like. To better protect women, a multifaceted approach is crucial. Raising awareness about the nuanced signs of abuse, regardless of one's socioeconomic status, is imperative. Cultivating a culture where friends, colleagues, and family members feel empowered to intervene and to report their suspicions can be a lifeline for victims. Professional networks, especially in high achieving professions such as medicine, should prioritize creating safe spaces for disclosure and for support. 
legal frameworks must adapt to provide swift and effective intervention, addressing the unique challenges survivors face during and after separation, investing in accessible mental health resources, economic empowerment programs, and educational initiatives can contribute to breaking the cycle of abuse. By fostering empathy, dismantling societal barriers, and offering robust support, we pave the way for a society where no one, regardless of their achievements, has to suffer in silence. Ilana Frick's legacy becomes a catalyst for change, inspiring a collective commitment to protecting vulnerable individuals from the shadows which conceal their suffering. In the aftermath of escaping abuse, women often find themselves navigating treacherous waters, facing a myriad of challenges which underscore the complexities of breaking free from the cycle of violence. It's crucial to recognize the stark realities that the period immediately following departure is, counterintuitively, one of the most dangerous for survivors. According to CanadianWomen.org, Women are 70 times more likely to be killed in the two weeks after leaving than at any other time during a relationship. Approximately every six days, a woman in Canada will be killed by her intimate partner. There were 1,181 cases of missing or murdered Indigenous women in Canada between 1980 and 2012, according to the RCMP. However, according to grassroots organizations and the Minister of the Status of Women, that number is much higher, closer to 4,000. Indigenous women are killed at six times the rate of non-Indigenous women. On any given night in Canada, 3,491 women and their 2,724 children sleep in shelters to escape abuse. On any given night in Canada, about 300 women and their children are turned away because shelters are already full. It's also important to remember that the rate of domestic violence is likely much higher than we know. 70% of spousal violence is not reported to the police. A CBC report highlights the alarming statistic that within the first six months of leaving her abuser, a woman's risk of violence at the hands of him skyrockets. This period, often referred to as the honeymoon phase of separation, is fraught with heightened danger, as the abuser, feeling a loss of control, may resort to extreme measures to regain dominance. 18 months after leaving, as detailed by Battered Women's Support Services, survivors still grapple with the aftermath, dispelling the myth that leaving equates to an instant restoration of one's safety. The complexities of legal proceedings, the emotional toll of healing, and the ongoing threat from the abuser can create a persistent atmosphere of fear and instability. Statistics from domestic shelters underline the grim reality that domestic violence can escalate to lethal levels when survivors attempt to break free. Homicide becomes an alarming risk during and after separation, underscoring the need for comprehensive support and safety planning during this vulnerable time. The myth of a clean break is easily shattered and replaced by the sobering truth that leaving is a process fraught with challenges, which demands strategic planning and robust support. The question, why doesn't she just leave him, oversimplifies the multifaceted factors that survivals grapple with post-separation. The emotional trauma, financial instability, and ongoing threats from their abuser create an intricate web which hinders a smooth transition to safety. Domestic violence shelters play a pivotal role in providing immediate refuge, but survivors often require sustained support to rebuild their lives and establish their independence. The aftermath of leaving abuse extends well beyond physical safety to encompass a myriad of emotional, psychological, and logistical challenges. Survivors may contend with issues such as financial dependence, housing instability, and the psychological scars left by years of manipulation and control. The intricacies of legal proceedings, such as restraining orders and custody battles, add additional layers of stress and uncertainty. 
Despite the hurdles, it's essential to acknowledge the resilience and strength exhibited by survivors as they navigate this tumultuous period in their lives. Empowering women to rebuild their lives requires a multifaceted approach, including access to affordable housing, economic resources, mental health supports, and legal advocacy. Comprehensive community support is instrumental in dismantling the barriers which trap survivors in the cycle of abuse. We've compiled a list of resources for you, which are easily accessible in the description box below. If you or a loved one are struggling with domestic abuse, I want you to know that there's hope for a beautiful future. And it all starts with making a safety plan. You can download my free safety planning guide as a starting point on your journey to freedom and healing. Remember, if you are in immediate danger, call the local police immediately. There is absolutely no shame in protecting yourself. The only person who has anything to be ashamed of is your abuser. And for everyone else watching, if you see something, say something. Violence can only thrive in silence. You can also feel free to connect with me on social media. All of my links are currently up on the screen and they're clickable in the description box as well. I am always posting exclusive content, doing giveaways and having contests, so follow me to stay in the loop. We just recently gave away a painting to the 100th follower on my Instagram account, and we will be giving one to the 250th follower as well, so don't delay. If you believe in the power of conversation, in dismantling the silence that shrouds domestic abuse, and in fostering empathy, then I invite you to be a part of the Memento Mori Stories community. Subscribe to our channel to stay engaged with thought-provoking stories, discussions, and creative expressions. Together, we can be a force for awareness, understanding, and healing. Your subscription is not just a click. It's a pledge to be a part of a movement which embraces the power of storytelling to bring about positive change. Remember, every voice matters, and yours can be a catalyst for good. Subscribe, share, and let's continue this journey together. The painting I've been working on today is called Media Vitae in Morte Sumus. In the midst of our lives, we die. And it took me about 48 hours to complete. I'm very proud of this one and I had a lot of fun putting it together. It's nine by 12 inches and composed of watercolor and gouache paint, Posca pen, India ink, and gold foil on 300 GSM, 140 pound cold pressed block. It, as well as many of my other original works are available for sale. And my books are currently open to custom commissioned work as well. Additionally, I still have an incredibly limited number of prints available for purchase. These are nine by 12 inches on archival quality cardstock and they go for 35 Canadian dollars each or $50 for two. I ship for free across Canada, but I am happy to ship worldwide for a nominal fee as well. I'm also opening my books to offer graphic design and branding consultations for serious clients. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please send me an email. Hello at stageleftproject.ca. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate, and never underestimate the impact of your voice. Remember, one day you will die. But for now, live well. Ciao for now.